How's it going? This is Karina with Tone Concepts, and I'm sitting here with none other than Alex Skolnick. My man, thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Karina. Appreciate it. All thank right. you, Tone Concepts. Thank you, Tone Concepts. Uh, so, just a couple questions for you. I'd like to start out, you just came back from tour. Can you tell me how it went? How was everything? Oh, yeah. I was uh, away for a month this time, and um, this, was, uh, this was great. We were in um, Australia, Japan, and Indonesia. And um, it was a very interesting trip. Um, the Australian dates were part of the Soundwave Festival, which, uh, for those who don't know, it's this annual festival. It um, goes through um, Adelaide, Perth, uh, Brisbane, Sydney, and, and Melbourne. And it's an all-day festival with all kinds of groups. and. The um, headliners were Green Day and Avenged Sevenfold. Um, not normally bands that we would be on the bill with, but uh, that's one of the cool things about you know you have shows out there, uh, you know, outside of the U.S. that where you have these crazy lineups, and it's fun, and I you know I I like that. And um, anyway, th those shows were great. We went to Japan, which was awesome, and um, finally wrapped up with. Indonesia. Um, our Indonesia trip was a little crazy because we were in and out and uh, we, we had a little bit of a spinal tap situation, but I won't get into that. You can Google Testament uh, Indonesia uh, Borneo and you'll, you'll, you'll find out yeah, all about it. That's so it's, it's never boring. That's great. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. And yeah, I'm sure you saw a whole lot of bands out there at the Soundwave Festival and stuff. Can you name a few things that guitar players mm -hmm. should never do on stage. A few faux pas, if you will. Oh, gosh. Um, you know what drives me nuts is the... Um, and I guess I, I do it sometimes, but I, I try to do it within reason, is the um, asking for applause. A total rock violation. You know, you, yeah, you should just get the but there are times where you can tell people they don't know that it's okay to play right because they're they're watching and but it, there's actually a moment so sometimes you need to kind of do this or, and it's 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 part of rock so right. but I think it can be overdone um, you don't want to rely on that and, um, and yeah I, I think uh, it's taken be a long time to, to find a balance between um, being a musician, a dedicated musician, hopefully with some depth, uh, and a performer. Because the, tr the truth is, it is a performance. Um, e even if you're playing you know, sophisticated instrumental music, uh, there's still an aspect of performance. People come to the show and they want to be entertained. So I think, you know, players who sort of, you know, just look down at the ground and, you know, just you know, play the guitar like this and don't even interact with the audience. Um, maybe they're, they're playing fascinating stuff, <laughs> fascinating patterns, but it's not that interesting. Um, you know, it helps to just bond with the audience. I think I mean, you have to read the, the audience too. And just uh, to get back to your question, one place where rock guitar players make this mistake is misreading the audience. If you have, um, say that you have a promotional mishap and you have, you know, like 10 or 12 people in the, in the audience, you don't act like it's a packed arena. Right. Very. You know important. what I mean? Absolutely. I've seen that a few times. Play, yeah. Play the show. Play the show well. Don't look pissed off, and you know, give these people a good show. But just you know, be honest. You're you're playing to a very small crowd. Um, yeah. Don't act like it's Madison Square Garden sold out night two. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about Testament back in the day versus Testament now? Just the writing process and how it's changed. Um, okay, the writing process evolves as the band evolves. Um, a lot of people don't know this because I, yeah, I'm considered an original member because I was on the first album. 
but the band existed before I was a part of it. Um, I joined the band you know, while I was in high school, and they, these guys were already gigging, and um, they were a few years older. They had um, a set of material already, so by the time um, I joined, we were recording our first album a couple years later, and a majority of that material was already written. Um, I just helped, you know, complete an album's worth of tunes. Um, so yeah, I wrote on on a few songs. Um, the second album is what it's what I often describe as uh, sophomore jinx. It's a common term. Um, I actually have a chapter in my book about this, and um, suddenly you have to come up with a whole album's worth of material quick. <laughs> not and easy. It's not easy. So you scramble, and um, in those days at least, you know, when you did a debut album, you would go on this touring cycle. So suddenly, you you know, we have this deadline coming up, so you have to write while you're touring. And, you know, being on, you know, your first tour, and everybody's, you know, young, and sort of seeing the world for the first time, it's it's hard to focus and do some writing. Somehow we did it, though. Somehow, um, uh, that, a lot of that was uh, Eric Peterson, the other guitar player, also the founder of Testament. A lot of that was us, um, sitting in the back of a, a bus. We finally had a bus oh, at that wow. time, thankfully. We didn't have a van anymore. <laughs> um, sitting in the back of a bus, you know, exchanging, throwing riffs back and forth. And somehow the album that we came up with, uh, New Order, is one of the favorite albums. Even though it was completely rushed, uh, we didn't have enough material. We actually had to write in the studio, on the spot. Our, our album got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't long enough. Contractually, it had to be a certain amount. Um, so that you know, so it was under all this pressure, um, and you know, I think the next few albums we were more used to it. Um, when I came back to the band in 2005, after you know being away a long time, um, we did this reunion and. We weren't even thinking about doing an album at first, but then we, when we decided to do an album, we took our time. And I think it had been like six years or so since the previous Testament album. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, of course, if we're going to do an album, yeah, we need to do it as soon as possible. But we really just said, okay, we're just going to not rush this. It's not going to be like the, the old days. We're just going to sort of take our time. And then it was a good thing because that record, The Formation of Damnation, uh, came out really well. Um, you know, and Eric had a lot of riffs for that album, so we had a good starting point. But then, okay, are we going to do another reunion album? And at this point, the reunion was a resurrection because that album, um, Formation of Damnation, got us back in the, in the game. Before that, the, the band had been playing, you know, dingbats or uh. places like that. And the, <laughs> Suddenly, we're supporting Motorhead, Heaven and Hell, Judas Priest, Wow, Slayer, Megadeth, Testament. You know, so it, thrust it back in the game. Yeah, we're thrust back in the game, and um, the next record we did, Dark Roots of Earth, it was sort of a return to yeah, you know, Eric and I kind of locking ourselves in, in a room and um, doing these riffs. Although we we sort of made a conscious decision that it's not fun to write on tour and no. it's, it's very difficult and I read um, Keith Richards autobiography which is great great and yeah all those great Rolling Stone songs uh, him and and Mick were resisting writing music they just they yeah, were so used to playing covers and there's this great scene in there of the, them being forced to sit in a kitchen and write music. I think it was one of the managers or somebody said, you guys have to write songs. Do it. This record is coming up. We need original music. And they did it. And, uh, yeah, sometimes you, you have to, to force it. And you have to decide who the main writers are. But. Right. And for Testament, do you think those high-pressure situations yielded 
better results or the more relaxed, we're going to take our time approach? Which you know, it didn't seem like it at the time. Right. <laughs> but looking back, you know, our most high pressure record is The New Order. The songs that get requested the most are from that album. The set we do now is filled with more tunes from that album than the other <laughs> albums. So maybe yeah. there's something to be said for that. Right. You know? That's great. What's the best piece of advice that you could give a beginner guitar player? Well, I would say, you know, remember why you're playing in the first place, right? It's supposed to be fun. You know, nobody picks this up and says, you know, wow, I, I want to, you know, just slave and get blisters and, you know, frustrate myself. You know, everybody does it because it's... It's uh, it's awesome. I mean, the, yeah, what a great thing! Right? It looks great. It looks. Amazing. We love guitars. <laughs> I have a few, um, and it it's fun to play. There's that's just nothing like it. As you're learning the instrument, uh, it can be hard to um, stay positive because you're going to encounter a lot of roadblocks. Um, so you know, I would definitely say um, stay positive. I would also say. Um, yeah, remember that it's about sound, and I think some players make the mistake of um, forgetting about sound and just you know learning scales and patterns and you know this sort of rudimentary material, which has its place, but ultimately it's it's really about making a sound. And then conversely speaking, do you remember the like just a great piece of advice somebody ever gave you when you were just starting out playing guitar? Yeah, well, uh, the first serious guitar teacher I had was uh, a guy named Mr. Satriani. Some people have heard of him. I think so. Uh, nobody knew who he was at the time, though, because he, he was just a local legend. And the guys that I studied with were you know, the, the rocker guys, the best rocker guys. Um, these guys had all studied with, with him, and I had heard these stories, you know, oh, Satriani, oh, he's a great musician, but you don't want to study with him, man. He's, he's too serious, serious, and he's too, you know, but, that, you know, why, would, why is that a bad thing? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but then again, this, this was Berkeley, California, you know, where everybody's pretty laid back, and it's, you know, the, having a, a teacher that's kind of a disciplinarian, was a bit frowned upon, but sure. obviously uh, that was the the best decision I ever made. It like, was to say, you know, screw that. I'm gonna take a lesson with this guy and see what happens. And I was with him for a couple years until his records started coming <laughs> out, and he started getting very busy. Well, I guess his student um, Steve Vai, who I had never heard of back then. Um, replaced Ingve. There you go. And I'd been an Ingve fanatic when I came to Joe Satriani. Um, and then Steve I replaced Van Halen. You know, um, you know how the story. And then he recommended um, Satriani to his record label, and that was sort of how those guys became like you know so well known. Right. But at the time he he was not well known, and uh, I came in to Joe. And you know, I had, I had my stock Ingve licks, sure. right? Because I had my stock Van Halen licks. I mean, you, yeah, back then, you know, you had to learn how to do this. Right. Of course. So, so Joe told me that um, you don't want to do that. <laughs> what are you talking about? You don't want to do of that. Of course you want to do that. Yeah, I want to do that. I've seen that. Yeah, so what Joe told me was, okay, yeah, learn it, but you, when a lick is that much of a signature, uh, you shouldn't play it. Wow. And maybe do variations on it. I joined, actually joined Testament while I was studying with him. I was uh, 16. And so, you know, instead of this, yeah, you know, I started doing like stuff like that. Right, I mean, that's basically hot for teacher. You know? Right. But maybe you know, like this. Uh, right, 
So it's right? borrowed. So it's variation. But yeah. Varied. It's like, okay, more notes are changing. It's not just the, the three finger triplet. Same thing. And even stuff like that, I started getting away from, but it just, it helped to know no, not to copy obvious licks and not to try to um, emulate, you know, whoever the, uh, the latest, most popular player was. And the funniest thing was, like, within a year or two, he, my <laughs> teacher, Satriani, was the guy that everybody's doing the Satriani thing, and, wow. yeah. So do you find that when you improvise, you throw in licks that you've learned from other people's music? And could you demonstrate a couple? Oh, definitely, definitely. So. But I do, uh, I've found a way to do variations on right. them now, which I... I stress that to, to students all the time. Okay, like this this is a lick that one lick that I like a lot. Okay. So that's uh, obviously Randy Rhodes. What I like to do is take that pattern. So like look at it. What what is it exactly? Well it's uh, this is a um, arpeggio. It's a four-note arpeggio, and then so um, up the arpeggio, down the scale, and then back a note. So even if you just take a, like, a little piece of the lick, up the arpeggio, down, down the scale, back up. So what if I move that into related? Um, positions. Ah. All, right. All of a sudden, it's the PBA. Yeah, you can do this anywhere. Yeah, any tempo. That's just the first piece of it. Let's look at the second half, or the, the next uh, pattern there. Right. right, so it's... So that's half the measure. Okay, second half of that, of the measure for that solo is... Right, so that's just a four note pattern. Right, and then back up a note. And a four note pattern. So um, what I might do is just play those four notes. One, two, sorry, five notes, five note pattern. Right? And move that around. Consciously thinking, oh, I'm taking that little piece of that Randy Rhodes solo, or does it just flow out naturally? When well, it's to, as for practice, yes. For practice. I'm saying, oh, I like that. I like that. And sometimes what happens is I'll be, yeah, you know, th that's a lick I worked out a long time ago. Sure. But sometimes if I'm working on a new lick, I'll take a little piece of it, and I'll and I'll do that just to get the lick down. But it ends up, I end up forgetting that it's even, it becomes part of the vocabulary, because now I can just use this, for, for example, maybe uh, across the strings. It's, so right just now, I was going up and down the same set of strings. But what if I go... All right, so that's a different set of strings. So strings one and two, strings two and three. Strings th uh, through. Strings two and three again. Where I'll keep going across the string. That's fun. Yeah. You know, fun with Randy Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> that and that's great. just Randy Rhodes. Yeah, obviously, yeah, there's so many players that you can experiment with and do variations with. Right. That was great, thank, thank you. Thank you. And that started from um, 
yeah, when I first started out, I would just learn the solos, and which is important as well. But later, um, and when I started started studying improvisation, and just really focusing on more jazz-oriented guitar players, uh, that was when that approach happened. Because there, you know, in the jazz idiom, you're supposed to make stuff up. It's not <laughs> supposed to sound like an existing solo, whether it's one of yours or anybody else's. It's supposed to sound different every time. And that's a great way to do it, is just take um, variations. So once I, you know, in, um, once I started playing more rock, having studied all this jazz stuff, that, that's when I applied that approach. This is difficult. If you Sorry. had to pinpoint one piece of music mm -hmm. that made the biggest, most lasting impression on you as a musician, what would you say? Oh my gosh. I know. That hard. is difficult. I know. Because there's too many. Too many. Or, uh, if you have to name two or three, you can do that too. If, <laughs> if that helps. Definitely um, the Eruption. Oh, we're talking about Van Halen because that made me want to play lead guitar. Um, that's a big one. That is a big one. And again, it's something like I rarely quote from it because it's so um, identifiable. But you know, I think you know everybody thinks of the uh, the, the three finger thing, right? Um, <laughs> But what about all that other cool stuff? Right? right, stuff like... Like, I don't know of anybody that did that. Just this simple, you know, picking like that. And he did that in um, Somebody Get Me a Doctor to B. But yeah, I mean, so it's not just eruption, but he did so many cool things. Like, what is this? Right, taking a triad and, you know, pick, pull, hammer, I mean, you can just get so much mileage out of that, so. Wow. Um, yeah, so I'd say, you know, eruption, but not the part everybody thinks of, like all the other stuff. The beginning. The, the bends. Yeah. Killer. All those crazy bends. And even, you know, it goes into You Really Got Me, right? Where, where he does that, uh, does that one crazy. <laughs> Whatever, you know? Uh, that whole thing. I would say, but yeah, those, if you think of that as one piece of music, Eruption and, uh, you really got me, um, at least at that time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for having us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming by. And, uh, I'll see you soon. This was fun. I'll okay. see you soon. <laughs>